Thanks very much for joining us today for the third Computer Science and Engineering Distinguished Lecture of the Year, this one co-sponsored with the Department of Economics. Uh, our speaker is Susan Athey. She studies uh, the economic aspects of the internet, things like auctions, search, marketplace design. Uh, several years ago, she won the John Bates Clark Medal for the uh, most significant contribution by an economist under the age of 40. She's had faculty positions at MIT, Stanford, Harvard, now Stanford again. It uh, lets you know that economics is a really tough field when someone like Susan can't hold a job. Uh, and today she's going to speak to us about machine learning meets economics. So Susan, thanks for being here. So thanks so much for having me here. I want to talk about some of the things that I have learned over the last few years um, from trying to do sort of economic engineering uh, in the real world. So for one uh, thing that, that Ed didn't mention is that I consult for Microsoft. So there's my disclosure at the front. Now all economists are being very careful about disclosure. So I, I've been consulting for Microsoft. Anything I say about Google you can take with a grain of salt, but I'll make sure to say a few very negative things along the way, <laughs> not to disappoint you. Um, so, uh, so I've been working for about five years uh, with Microsoft's search engine, and I've been doing uh, academic research on that data through Microsoft Research, and I've also been consulting with the search engine on how they actually design and operate their marketplace. And this has been just a fa fabulous education in engineering and computer science and economics all at once. And so along the way, I've had a lot of observations about what the different disciplines bring to the table. I've been able to see the unique value that I could bring as often a lone economist in a room with engineers or computer scientists or statisticians. Um, and I've also seen some of the things that I think that I can learn from, uh, that economics can bring in from these other disciplines. And I'm confronting these problems in, in carrying out my own research, so I have sort of a personal interest in seeing some of those of you out here solve some of the problems that, uh, that I see. And so I've had some, you know, I, I started my career as a theorist, um, and I'm still doing some theoretical work, but I'm more focused on empirical work. So one of the observations I have is that there's a couple of, of areas of connection of economics and, and computer science. One of them is sort of algorithmic game theory and mechanism design, and mechanism design is an area I've done theory in, and so it's a very exciting nexus. But the, the area that I think has had sort of less connection at conferences and in terms of the academic community is econometrics and machine learning. And so, and I think actually the possibility for transformative papers that really change the way these disciplines um, do their research and, and, and really lead to whole different methodologies, I think the possibilities are even greater there than on the theory side where we've seen a lot of the connection so far. So, Hopefully, when I, at the end of today, even if you don't like everything that I've said, I hope that I, I encourage some of the young people out there to take a look at this nexus. I'll, I'm going to tell you where I think the opportunities are. If you look, you might find different opportunities, but I, I'm really convinced that the opportunities are there. Let me jump in with my roadmap. I'm going to start out in the first part of my talk in a more kind of general conversation around economic versus machine learning methodology. I want to set up for you, um, especially for the computer science part of the audience, you know, what is it that economists are trying to do and why? And then I'm going to spend the, the second part of the talk using this methodology that I've sort of motivated as well as some of the open questions and applying them to online advertising. So I'm going to give a specific paper that I've worked on to make it concrete and also to help, again, illustrate where an, an, econo an economist approach would be different and the kinds of things that we do um, that aren't as easily done with the machine learning toolbox. So um, one of the first important things about, you know, a difference between what an economist would attempt and a machine learning scholar might attempt is, and, I, and again, I'm going to make generalizations. I have to make generalizations here, so I apologize for offending those of you in both sides who don't fit neatly into the stereotypes. Um, but so an economist is, is very focused on making counterfactual predictions. So they want to predict what would happen if the world changed. And this is something that's kind of central to our, you know, our raison d'etre. So if you take the case like the Department of Justice has to decide whether two firms can merge. Those firms have not been merged before, okay? And, and this might be a, a unique industry. 
So you know, we, we, can't, we can't look at, you know, train a model on, you know, industry A and just apply it to industry B and assume the effect of, you know, a merger between, you know, two grocery store chains is going to be the same as a merger of Coke and Pepsi. And so we're, we're going to have to come up with a model that's going to predict in a world that we haven't seen before and really where we think the whole joint distribution of the observable variables will change because you can look out in the past and you can look at a correlation between prices and population and income and the city size and transportation and so on. But once the two firms merge, you know, that joint distribution is going to change. And so economists believe that we can build models that can predict what would happen in that new world even though the joint distribution has changed. And so, you know, I think that this is, um, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of machine learning is about prediction, but there's a sense in which, you know, you've got this, you've got the stochastic process, you want to do a good job predicting the stochastic process, but if the fundamental joint distribution of your random variables changes, it's kind of out of scope, you know, <laughs> you've got to train a new model. And, and that's, and, and so in some sense, the reaction I get from machine learning people when I really make clear what it is we're trying to do is like, well, you're crazy. <laughs> you can't do that. You know, that's magic. Like, there, there, there's, there's, you know, at first I kind of just thought you were, you know, you were fudging on what you wanted to do. But if, you're, if this is really, you know, it, it, when I explain why their techniques won't work for me, then they say, well, no techniques could possibly work. So, you know, you're, you're sort of on a, on a, on, you're doomed. And so, you know, maybe that's true. Um, but let me try to explain to you a little bit about, first of all, you, know, you still have to make a decision whether or not you like it, so we need to do the best we can because one way or another, a merger is going to be approved or, or not approved, um, and you know, we need some basis for that decision, so we're going to try really hard because we have to make decisions. But I also want to talk about the ways in which we can do that in the most principled and scientific way possible. Okay. So in order to achieve this kind of objective, um, you really need to ha believe that you have a good model, a a, what we call a structural model of the world. And you have to believe that you, your statistical model has actually identified a causal effect. So it's not just that you know, X and Y tended to move together, but you have to really believe that X caused Y to move. Okay? And if you believe that it was truly that X that caused Y to move, then if you, and you believe you've, you've estimated that relationship, then you can predict what would happen if, if you increased x in an environment where it hadn't been increased before. Okay? But that's a, that's a very challenging thing to do, and it turns out that you design models much differently and with a much different emphasis if that's your goal. Um, and the, the, so, the, so basically, you know, a huge part of econometrics has developed the, the theory and the practice of how to do a really good job with that. Okay, so you know one of the kinds of techniques we've used, and there are many, many. This is a, an enormous literature, but you know something that I can sort of communicate uh, heuristically, and I'll try to give you some examples of today, is that you've got a data set out there, and you've got x's and y's, and you haven't got experimental variation in your x's. So you know you've you've got people out there, and they've gone to school for a certain number of years, and they've got a wage. But you know, it's not. You didn't have an experiment that took all of you and assigned some of you to Harvard and some to Princeton and some to Yale and so on. That it, so I can estimate the effect of going to Harvard. I don't have that experiment. So the question is, you know, if I've got this observational data, is there still something I can get out of it? Some of the techniques that economists have focused on are techniques for using only the good variation and ignoring the bad variation. Heuristically, it's sort of quasi-experimental. So, for example, you know, people have studied the effect of military service, and so obviously joining the military isn't something that's experimentally assigned, but your draft lottery number before the Vietnam War was randomly assigned. And so you, have, you might observe people's draft lottery number and their military service and their wage, and from that data set, you can get a causal effect of military service. And you have to, but your bottle has to be built in a very specific way to isolate the good things you can learn, the randomness is in the lottery numbers, the randomness is not in the military service, but the, because the lottery numbers affected military service, you can actually learn something. You can't learn everything, but you can learn some things. And so there's a whole, um, there's a whole literature about exactly what you can learn and when. Okay? 
with that kind of background of sort of what we're trying to do and the fact that there's some chance that we might actually have some techniques that have a hope of doing this, let me then um, talk, to you, talk to you about the different ways economists have approached my specific topic area, which is market design. Okay, so market design is, broadly speaking, it's, it's, it's the design of marketplaces where you, that, that are actually organized in some way. So eBay is the marketplace, is, the rules are set by eBay. And so the design of the eBay market is about, you know, what are the rules? How do I sort things? How do I search things? What are the reserve prices? What are the fees? All of those are the elements of actively designing a marketplace. Um, and so in the, these marketplaces are special because it's not just, you know, decentralized, some firms setting prices and consumers buying them, but the rules of the market are, 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 more, are more centralized. So auction markets, advertising markets, eBay, these are all examples of this. So what are the ways that we have done empirical work in this area? So one alternative is field experiments. Um, so in field experiments, we say field because it's not students in a laboratory, it's that you're actually trying different things out in practice. You can compare design alternatives, and you can also use this kind of data to create variation. So for, I've done some, some research on timber auctions where they, you know, they randomly assigned different tracts of land to be either first price sealed bid auctions or open ascending auctions. So that kind of data, that, that kind of experiment can give you data from the different games and, and that can be used. But those are relatively rare. Something that economists, and I, this is gonna, something I'm gonna try to focus on is a, something that machine learning can really bring into economics and, and, and I, even before I learned about machine learning, I've been trying to advocate for in economics is doing a much better job with mo model validation. So no self-respecting machine learning person would, do, would train a model and then not validate it by testing it out of sample. Like that would just be nuts, okay? It's just, wouldn't even consider it. So in economics, partly because of where we came from and the kinds of problems we were trying to solve, that is not the expectation. The expectation in many, many cases, most cases, you know, maybe 95% of, of these structural models, these micro econometric structural models, we don't do really any serious validation, okay? So we might try to test the assumptions, we justify the assumptions and so on, but we don't do the validation and it's not that we don't care about it, it's just that it, it, was, that it wasn't it's not really the convention because we usually only see one situation. You know, we're trying to predict what would happen if firms merge. And maybe you can come back later and two years later the firms do merge, but 10 other things changed and you had a recession and so, you know, you just can't really do a good job with it. Or you might wonder, you know, what would happen if Treasury, if, if the Treasury, you know, switched from a certain auction format to another format. But, you know, you, it, maybe they eventually they even do switch, but then you just have before and after. You're not, you're not seeing them in parallel. So it's just very rare to have the kind of variation that allows you to do that. So I did it in Timber because I had this experiment, but that was relatively rare, okay? So we also, I've, I've already talked about sort of these observational data and using these techniques. So the, the technique of only using the good in variation, instrumental variables is one of our main techniques. It's a sort of a class of techniques. And so the instrumental variable is something like the draft lottery number. It's a variable that affects the, the, the treatment but is not correlated with the unobservable features of the person. So, so these, are, these are used, but this is less often used in, in the market design area. And then the structural models I've talked about, we're gonna start out by making behavioral assumptions, something like profit maximization or rational decision making. Then we're gonna have usually observational data to estimate economic primitives. And then we can use these to evaluate market design changes and algorithms. For example, if I know, the example I'm gonna show today, I'm gonna say, well, if I knew the valuations of the search advertising bidders, I could predict what would happen if I changed my algorithms in a particular way, okay? Um, you can also make efficiency versus revenue trade-offs, and in market design, that's one of the central things you have to worry about. That there's, it's often the case that the thing that maximizes the size of the pie is not the same as the thing that maximizes the profit to the auctioneer or the profit to the seller. And so, in order to make those trade-offs between efficiency and revenue, you have to understand what people's preferences are. You have to know how well off you have made them. And so understanding people's preferences is critical to making those trade-offs. And also, of course, we want to consider market designs not currently in use. Okay? So in the history of econometrics, there's been 
A little bit of, a, of wars between all three of these things, they aren't often brought together. And so when I give a talk to a pure economics audience, I spend a lot more time talking about how in the online world, one of the big lessons is something I believed before I went in, maybe it's partly why I found the, the search advertising problem so appealing, is that you cannot do the, you cannot do, operate a search business or a search engine without all of these tools. They are all critical, essential parts of how these firms are operated, and the engineers out there who have to make the things work, they can't afford to be, um, to be religious about their methods. They have to bring together what works. Now, for the computer scientists among you, what may be sort of interesting is that, you know, this whole structural model thing, that this all might sound a bit foreign, and so actually what one thing that an economist would say when you look at it through our lens is that, say, you know, the, the, one of the fundamental engines behind, say, Google's AdWords or Microsoft's Ad Center is a structural model. Um, so I want to kind of explain to you what that is, and that'll maybe help flesh out what a structural model is. On the field experiment side, the, the fact is that nothing changes in Google, nothing changes in Bing without an experiment. Everything goes through experiments. So this is like the ultimate data-driven business. So if you, if you think the world can live with just models and no experiments, you're also very much out of luck because the experimental process is just critical and central. One of the things that the, having these, these, though even within a firm, some of the academic debates and divides have their own sort of real world incarnation in that the experimental team can be very different than the machine learning algorithmic team. So you have some people who are, who believe nothing, you can't learn anything without an experiment and other people who are experts in models. So you still have that clash, but yet they coexist. So the experiments are used for, um, for deciding whether an algorithm gets rolled out and the algorithm itself is a structural model. Okay? So let me just give an example, so quick prediction. Any firm that organizes a web, a, a, a web page has to decide what to put where. And so it turns out, and you, know, you can do lots of experiments to show this, that when you design the web page, you're a bit of a puppeteer. Now you may think that you have free will and that you click on just what you were gonna click on and that you know, Google or Amazon or whoever designed this web page doesn't influence you, but statistically, if, if, if it may be true for you, but it's not true in general. If I re-rank things, I move clicks and I can move them a lot. So getting the things in the right order is just crucial. That is like the, the, one of the biggest drivers of, uh, of, of outcomes. So of course, you've got you know, a, a big chunk of your queries you've never seen before, and another big chunk of them you see very rarely. And you have many, many things that could go on the screen. So I might have you know, 200 ads whose keywords are, are at least in some way related to what, if I typed in what shoes should I wear to the tennis match tonight, you know, there might be 200 different ads that are in some way relevant to that query. So you've got to decide how would each of those perform on this page, and I've got to order them. So, you know, the computer scientists are, are very good at, at, at hard problems. This gets big very fast, right? There are lots of combinations of how you could put things on the screen. Couldn't possibly learn about this from just an experiment. So you need a model that's going to predict counter... I, so I saw these ads out there in the past, maybe on this query, maybe on similar queries, and I want to know counterfactually what would happen if I changed the order. So this is a very simple structural model that you're basically trying to decompose the, ad, the, the effect of the advertisement how clicky is this advertisement intrinsically from the position? And I might never have seen it in the top position, but I want to know how many clicks would it get counterfactually if I put it in the top position. Okay, so it's a very simple structural model. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's structural because I, I really want to get a causal estimate of what would happen if I rearrange things, and I need to get that exactly right. But what I've got out there is observational data because the, I've seen the ads out there. It's not random where the ads were placed. The ads were placed where they were because of who clicked on them in the past and how much they bid and all sorts of other things. So I've got this observational data from which I need to get a real prediction of what would happen in an environment I haven't seen before. Okay? So, and this is like the most important algorithm in the you know, tens of billions of dollars machine that is Google. Okay? So now let's talk about exactly you know, how the different kinds of models and experiments are used in this algorithm. So the algorithm is going to predict clicks for alternative rankings of content. I'm going to use an experiment to test algorithm A versus algorithm B. 
Each algorithm can spit out scores which, which would be used to rank the content. So the score is the clickiness of the ad. Okay? So al an algorithm itself may have experimentation built into it. So like the benchmark algorithm that's running might occasionally uh, rank, give sort of noisy scores in a sense to re-rank things to, to learn more about what would happen. But usually what's going to happen in these algorithms is they're going to use all the data because they're sort of data starved. Data is incredibly important. You, you want to use all the data you can. And so you're not really willing to, to, to go through just if 1% is experimented on, that's not enough data. So you typically mix together the good variation and the bad variation. So in some sense, this is something that you know, could be improved with better science. So you've got experimentation going on inside the algorithm. You also have experimentation between algorithms. Then what's going to happen is these different algorithms are going to produce different rankings, and then users are going to click. Okay, so the, and, and some users are going to get algorithm B, some are going to get algorithm A. You can measure the clicks, and you'll use that to, to choose the algorithms. Now, those in real time, you're going to count up the clicks, and so these models are going to look at the database of the outcome and feed that information back in real time. So if people are clicking a lot on this ad today, then at some point that, that aggregate will get fed into the model so that it's going to be learning all the time. But these, this is also going to affect the advertiser. So if we're thinking about ranking advertisements, the advertiser is going to see outcomes as well. Now, if only 1% of traffic is getting algorithm B, they're not going to notice that. They're going to be getting most of their traffic from algorithm A. They're going to get clicks. They're going to see prices and so on. Then eventually, a day later, a week later, for many of them a couple of months later, they're going to change their bids. That changes the database of a potential content. And so the performance of the algorithm and all of the outcomes will change once the advertisers respond. And herein lies the problem. And this is where the economist sort of comes in and explains. You know, a, a, a friend from Yahoo uh, gave the anecdote that, well, you know, for years, like, we would, we would do this experiment, and we would see it would increase revenue by 5%. And then the next month, we would do an experiment, and it would increase revenue by 5%. And every month, we had 5% increases of revenue, but at the end of the year, our revenue was the same as it was at the beginning. What happened? We had randomized controlled experiments. What went wrong? Well, what went wrong was that these were not experiments on advertisers. They were experiments on users. Only 1% 1 of the traffic was affected by the experiment. The advertisers didn't respond. But then over time, the advertisers did respond. But by the time half of them responded, you had changed the algorithm three times. So you had no hope of figuring out what particular outcome had led to this effect. And so you didn't know why. All you know is that your, your, your experimentation wasn't working. And you had no idea why. The, the scientific answer might be, well, then you should experiment on advertisers, right? I should randomize my advertisers. The problem with that is that it, some of them take four or six months to respond. Very expensive. Of course, the guy who's in the treatment group is not happy if he's suddenly his price has doubled for the, that six-month period. He might have quit and gone on and taken his money somewhere else. So if Google doubled his price, he might come spend his money on Bing. Um, and so you know, that's a problem. It's expensive. It's disruptive. And then the advertisers interact with each other, so you'd actually have to split by markets. So it, it's quite complicated and expensive. You can't do very many of these things. So as a result, you've got to, to, to figure out how I can use these cheap, cheaper experiments to run where I use a small percentage of traffic. I learn how the algorithm works, but I have to predict how the advertisers will respond. And that's where structural models can come in. So um, let me say a few words now, just kind of sum up that my, where I think the, especially the graduate students out there, there are some interdisciplinary learnings. And then I'm going to go try to illustrate those learnings um, in my specific application. So in terms of econometrics, what can econometrics bring in? Well, of course, machine learning and all the different statistical disciplines all have their own little mini debates between Bayesian and classical. But what I have found is that in my studies, Bayesian methods seem like they have a lot of appeal. Because you have lots and lots of advertisers, I, you know, hundreds of thousands of advertisers. They have tens of millions of bids, you know, and they're all different. They all have different objectives. They have different situations. And so a Bayesian model is especially good for, um, for trying to work with those kinds of problems of the classifications and the fact that I won't even know at the end for sure I'm going to have a posterior. Bayesian models are also great for making real decisions. I'm going, to ma I'm going to introduce an algorithm change that's going to affect everybody in all these different ways. I can't possibly imagine I'm going to be able to predict you know, exactly what's going to happen. But I'd like to have a nice posterior distribution so that we can think about you know, the expected payoffs to us 
and evaluate you know, our loss function over all of these different outcomes. My loss function isn't necessarily going to be linear. So the Bayesian model is very good for decision making. Econometrics, so one of the things that I, you know, I picked up a basic machine learning textbook, started looking through it. This particular machine learning textbook had the entire textbook and no standard errors anywhere in it. And at first, I was shocked. I was stunned. How can this, how can you possibly teach an undergraduate statistical course and have no standard errors? How can you have methods and just say that they look like they perform well and there's no asymptotic theory? But then I thought about it a little bit more and I realized that actually economists have sort of gone the other way. Everything in an economics paper is about the standard error. But in fact, you know, that's about sampling error. And actually, the bigger problem is the model specification error. So, so we, we shouldn't just reject the machine learning print things out of, I, I'm, not, I'm still not sure if I could publish a paper using a technique without a standard error. But it, it's not, and that's the way the economics world works, but it's not clear that's the way the economics world should work. We've put all of our eggs on this t-statistics and nothing almost on the, on, on, we, informally we talk a lot about model specification, but not formally. More emphasis on testing and validating structural models. So I also I already talked about that. So in some of my work on timber, I, I did this. But now I'm going to am able to do it in the search advertising markets. Why? Because I see the algorithms change every month. So I can actually estimate a model on a couple of months and then predict how they should respond to a new algorithm change. This is unlike many economic applications. It's really rich. It'll give me a chance to publish interesting papers and try to further promote this idea. Um, more emphasis on learning objectives rather than assuming behavior. And I'm going to talk about that later. Um, Data-driven model selection and segmentation um, using more machine learning techniques that are really designed for this. So in economics, we select our models by hand. And if I told you that I used a machine to do it, then I might not get published because it would invalidate my standard errors, and my standard errors are everything. Okay? But in fact, you know, you're using a machine to do it, and you're telling me the algorithm you used to select your model, so you're being much more transparent than me. But you can't publish your paper in an economics journal. So, as intellectual leaders, we can try to change that and try to substitute some of the criteria. I can't just take away the standard errors and have nothing to replace them with, so I need to develop, you need to help me develop new ways for economists to present their, these kinds of results. Large number of features, um, maybe sometimes we do want some formal properties of these machine learning methods, but we need to figure out what the right question is, not necessarily the standard error question. You guys should have Hal Varian come back here. He's doing time series econometrics and what he has learned about machine learning and econometrics. One place where he and I are very aligned is that um, we both believe there's a lot of really interesting research to be done here, but he's looking at a totally different set of issues. Machine learning, causality. You know, it's very hard to have a conversation with a lot of the, 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 the folks um, about how to think about some non-experimental data and still get causal estimates. So how would I incorporate, you know, this into scalable models? Um, even, and, and especially what do we do if I still don't have enough variation to be identified. The slides I skipped, I showed how I used a whole bunch of experiments that were designed for completely different purposes at Microsoft as instruments in order to, to estimate a better click prediction model. That's something that can be explored more fully. I work on designing markets and particularly auction-based platforms, so things like eBay. Um, they're platform markets when you have different customers and the platform is trying to internalize externalities, things like indirect network effects, advertisers care about how many users there are, um, users care about how many other users there are because that attracts advertisers and so on. eBay, Google, and, and Microsoft um, use cars and so on. There are lots of these kinds of markets out there and growing in popularity with the internet. So what are some of the insights, first of all, the economic insights that, that motivate us to do the empirical work? Well, one of the first important theoretical insights is that we, we have a trade-off between the size of the pie and the distribution of the rents. So the, if I want to have the most efficient auction, that looks different than the revenue maximizing auction. The si simple example of this is I raise the re reserve price, I can get more revenue by charging higher prices when people, when people do buy, but sometimes I price people out of the market. It's inefficient, but I raise more revenue. And I'm going to show you some more interesting examples in a few minutes. But if you're trying to, if you're, especially if you're a competing platform, you're trying to attract people to your marketplace. So if you charge too high prices to advertisers, they're going to go and spend their money somewhere else. Okay, this is one reason competition is good in search, because you can compete for the advertisers, and it motivates the search engines to keep their prices low. You can mislead yourself by focusing on the short run, and you get these real biases 
in, in a, a real business operation because you can measure the short term so well, you can't measure the long term, but the long term is actually where the money is. So one of the theoretical insights is that the, the, sh the long run can often way outweigh the short run. You do the opposite thing in the short run. What's bad for revenue in the short run is good for revenue in the long run. The models can help with that. And I, in my work on timber, I showed those magnitudes. It was, entry was much more important than revenue extraction um, in, terms of, uh, um, in terms of overall long run revenue. The indirect channel can dominate. So for internet search advertising, we have a few things. Um, there's substantial trade-offs between efficiency and short-run revenue. Because of the way the auctions work, you have these quality scores, and you can use these quality scores to price discriminate. If you want to, you can realize that high-value bidders often also get higher click-through rates. And so I can use the quality scores in the way that the quality score algorithm works to charge higher prices to high-value people. It's going to distort efficiency but extract more revenue from, from the, the high-value people. You also can have things like incentives to show too many irrelevant ads. So it's very important to incorporate long-run bidder and user responses in this. And as I talked about, we need models because it's too expensive and, and difficult to run experiments for every change you make. Okay, so here are search ads, you all know those. So I want to show you briefly the auction, because now to make specific how we model the auction, I need to tell you about the auction. A very sad thing for me in trying to give uh, quick and easy to understand seminars is just the title of the auctions that are run on search advertising prices. If only I could just say you bid and you pay your bid. No, I have to say they run a click-weighted, generalized second price auction. And every one of those terms is important for what's going to come. So let me tell you just briefly how this works. So you're, you're, you have a price for being in position M determined using the estimated revenue per impression from the guy below you. So, but just take for granted that it's a much better thing to do to sell clicks than it is to sell spots on, just to, to, sell, to sell separately the different places on the page. If I'm going to sell clicks, it's still the case that an ad takes up space on the page. So the opportunity cost of putting this ad here is how much revenue I could get from putting somebody else there. But if, I, if I'm, people are bidding clicks, I have to in some way convert a per-click bid, you're going to pay only when somebody clicks, to a value per the spot on the page, per the impression. Okay? So the way we do that is we have a, we, we use this click prediction algorithm to estimate the clickability score. And so when I rank in price, I'm going to use those clickability scores. So another early learning in this, in this industry, uh, sort of independently discovered by some economists um, at uh, goto.com and, and some folks inside of Google, pay your bid auction did very badly, and so they replaced it with this generalized second price auction. This was one of the great mistakes of this, of, of, of sort of auction design, because they didn't, they should have designed a Vickery auction probably, and if they had, they would still be running it, for those of you who know those different terms. Um, and I've kind of gotten the scuttlebutt from all the people were there, and it was just kind of engineering decisions, and then it was hard to change, and the victory seemed complicated, and nobody ever done this before anyways. It wasn't like there was some principled reason they used the generalized second price auction. So a victory auction is an auction that actually gets people to reveal their values, and the idea of a victory auction is that you pay for your externality. So if I'm in the top position, I move everybody else down the page, and so I have to compensate them for the clicks they lost, everybody else. So your payment should depend on everybody else's uh, bid that, that, that you move down the page. A generalized second price auction is simpler. Your price just based on the person below you. If there's just one unit, they're the equivalent because you're only displacing one person. And so a second price auction is a victory auction when there's a single unit. But when you have multiple units, they're not the same anymore. So, um, so, but the thing about the generalized second price auction that was very nice is that you pay the minimum amount you need to maintain your position, and that means that there's not incentives for bidders to keep trying to jump over each other by one cent. And that, that was a huge problem before they changed this. There's a very nice paper by um, Edelman and Ostrovsky showing how, how badly things went until they switched. There was all sorts of cycling. Now we're, 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 we're in this world. So what happens in the auction? So I have three bidders. They're not actually ranked in order of their bids. They're going to be ranked in, term, in terms of their estimated revenue bid. And I need to normalize them all to the first position. So the clickability, this S, is how many clicks I think you would get if I put you in the top position. So I'm going to rank them in this order. If these bids were, were representing values, this would maximize the total surplus created on the page, because that would be the clickability times the value. 
So that's kind of the motivation. This is the actual surplus that's being created. The per click bid times the number of clicks. That's the economic activity. Okay. So, um, so this generalized second price auction says you're going to pay the minimum price per click that you could have bid to maintain your position. So to maintain my position, I have to be greater than or equal to the guy below. So if you just set my revenue bid equal to the revenue bid of the guy below, then I can solve for the bid that makes those two tie. And so what I'm going to actually pay is the revenue bid of the guy below divided by my quality score. Okay. So, so that's going to mean that your per price per click that you're charged depends on your quality score as well as the quality score of the guy below you. And that's where the price discrimination opportunities come in, because those quality scores are produced by an algorithm. They're not shown to you. They can be whatever they want. They can be set at the advertiser cross-query level and so on. So there's lots of opportunities to wiggle with the prices while still staying in the framework of this auction. Okay, and there's papers written about um, it, the, some scientists from Yahoo Labs called this squashing is one, one way you can price discriminate. So it's certainly not lost on the industry. Um, so, the, so then what do I do? How do I figure out how much revenue I'm going to get from each bidder? Well, this is the price per click. If I multiply it by the probability of a click, then the estimated revenue I get, the price per click times the number of clicks, is just equal to the estimated revenue bid by the guy below. So it's really the revenue bid of the guy below is determining the expected revenue you extract from me. Okay, so this is the way the auction works. And then there's a reserve price, so the guy in the bottom um, pays something that's determined by the reserve price. And by the way, reserve prices are extremely important empirically. You know, a pretty large fraction of clicks are priced by reserve prices. So again, the auctioneer, the active design of this market is very important in determining the outcomes. I see most of the literature, the early literature, including Hal Varian, who was there when this came in, as well as some of the economists who were at Yahoo, um, Edelman, Ostrovsky, and Swartz wrote papers about this auction. And they modeled it as if this happened sort of once and for all. So there was going to be one user entering a query. The, the bidders were going to be able to anticipate all of this. And so they studied the equilibrium to this auction. Because of the discreteness and so on and complete information, there was a multiplicity of equilibria. So there's a lot of emphasis about that. It turns out that that's sort of completely off point for the real world. Because in the real world, the same bids are going to apply to lots and lots of different user queries. While that auction is being run, it's going to be run lots of times. So just here's an example. So we've got people entering the term mortgage calculator all day long. Okay? And you're not, you're not allowed to, you're not able to change your bid sort of second by second. I mean, you can change it at any time, but it takes a little while to go into the system. So in practice, it's really kind of hourly or so is the max you could change it. And most bidders get changed much less often than that. We've got advertisers who have ads in the database. And actually, each advertiser could have multiple ads. So here's two different ads from LendingTree. And so the search engine is going to be figuring out which of those ads to show. And they could have different bids, or they could have the same bid. So somebody enters the query. The delivery engine is going to figure out who are all the bids. They're going to get that out of the database. Then the scoring algorithm, boom, has to produce the scores in real time. Um, then you're going to select ads, rank them, score them, price them, and a user will click on the ad. Then another user comes along, and it happens again. And so one of the key things is the scoring algorithm is updating in real time using data and so on. So the scores are going to vary. And they also can be based on user characteristics and so on. So actually, you're facing a very continuous problem as a bidder. You couldn't possibly know what the scores would be in the next 10 queries, even if you did know, which you don't, what they had been in the last 10 queries. So really, the better way to think about this is that the advertisers are kind of turning a dial. Their bid is sort of telling them, how, this, this is from a, from a user interface. It's sort of an older one, but it's got a nice visual. Where you change the bids, you can get more clicks. If you lower your bid, you're going to get less clicks. You can also do the same thing for prices. And the higher you bid, the higher price you pay, the more clicks you get. The, and, and that's happening because you're going to, you know, sometimes if you bid more, you're on average going to appear at the top. So you're on average going to pay a higher price per click. But it, you're going to move around. Okay, So that uncertainty. So it turns out that this actually simplifies the problem a great deal. So because the, you're actually having uncertainty, instead of facing this lumpy, discrete problem with multiple equilibria, it's actually a smooth problem that's differentiable, and you can prove ex existence and uniqueness and so on. So in a paper I have with Denis Nekopolov, we, we study the properties of this. We estimate bitter values using a structural model. And then we compute the things, and we do counterfactuals. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that and also kind of preview some of our, our um, current work. Because actually, Dennis was here last week, I learned this morning. And some of the economists have, have seen uh, some of this in more detail. But I'm going to maybe highlight a few different things. 
So just when we think about the bidder's problem, the bidder's solving an optimization problem, they're choosing their bid to maximize their value per click times the quantity of clicks minus the total cost of the clicks. And the total cost is going to be determined in those auctions, as is the quantity. So the, the auction is kind of in the background. But the bidder doesn't see the individual auctions. They just see feedback on how many clicks I got and how much it cost. Nonetheless, from experimentation, as well as the tools that are provided, you can figure out what would happen if you changed your bid, bidder experimentation now. And so the first order conditions would say that the, that the, that the, the bidder should, if they're optimizing with respect to their bid, their value should be equal to the ratio of the additional cost it gets you to get um, from raising your bid to the additional clicks that you get. Okay? So this is the sort of more literally the way it works, but it, it's actually maybe even easier to understand the problem the advertiser's facing if you realize they're really just using the bid to turn a dial. They're not paying their bid, they're, they're just choosing a number of clicks. So I can reformulate the problem equivalently as just choosing a quantity of clicks. Now I can maximize V times the quantity of clicks minus the total cost of a click. Which, for the economist out there, I can rewrite that as the quantity of clicks times the value minus the average cost of the clicks. So this is just a classic monopsony problem that you teach in sort of Econ 1. Okay, and the first order condition is value equals marginal cost. And so the, the economic intuition, which we tell all of our undergraduates, but I'll repeat here in this context, is that you don't bid all the way up to where the, the, marginal, the average cost of a click is equal to your value, because that would give you no profits. Your cost would be equal to your value. You, you'd be indifferent. Rather, you shade back. You, you, you buy less clicks. And how much? Well, you take into account that the more clicks you buy, the more each one costs. And so that inframarginal effect is how much you shade your bid. The model is that all bidders do this. Okay, and I'm going to look in a particular week, and I'm going to say, you know, they, they looked at the data last week, and they optimized this week. I'm going to imagine they all updated their bids. And so all of their bids, at, at every moment, you know, at the moment I looked at, are perfectly rational, because economists argue to you that every bidder is perfectly rational, and everybody profit maximizes. And so from that, I can infer, if I can just estimate what this marginal cost is, which I can using Microsoft's data, I can figure out for every bidder exactly what their value is. And then I can predict what they would do in any circumstance, because I know not only their value, but how they behave. So if I change the, the Qs and the Ts, or, or equivalently change the marginal cost function, I can predict how they'll change their bid. So it's a set of behavioral assumptions together with the, the data that, that allows me to estimate the values. And then it's the behavioral assumption together with the estimate of the value that allows me to make the counterfactual predictions. Okay? So it's all lovely. It's gorgeous um, if it's right. Okay? Um, and so it gives you a principled way to make predictions, but the question is, is of course, going to be how, how good those are. Um, I will say, though, that just, you know, it's a, as a place to start, even, I'm going to get into how I generalize the model later, but as, even if you took this model literally and, and, and even if it's wrong, it's going to give you, in some sense, you know, a very different kind of prediction than if you just trained a machine learning model on historical data. Because, it, say, a change in reserve prices could really change the shape of the marginal cost curve. And it, it's going to create incentives for bidders to do things that are quite different. So this model is really going to be trying to look at things from the perspective of a bidder facing an optimization problem, which would think, get you looking at very different variables than just what's the historical correlation between bids and, and prices and, and so on. So just as a little schematic of what we do, um, we have a historical auction data, and we imagine this is sort of the same data that the bidders can, can get summary statistics of. We, take, we look at each bidder one by one. We take their current bid, and then we, we simulate what would happen if they changed their bid. And again, there's an analog. They can, they can do this in the user interface, or they can actually experiment if, if you want to know how the bidders would figure this out. We're imagining that all bidders figured this out well, we estimate the, how the quantity of clicks changes with bids as well as how the cost of clicks changes with bids. And then we differentiate and take the ratio to get the values. We have two methods, one based on normality and one that's non-parametric. Both of them we've implemented at scale, so we can do them on you know, tens of millions of, of, uh, of bidders and so on. So here's a specific example of what this would look like from a particular bidder. Okay, and this particular bidder, so I've, on the, on, I've done this in the, in the quantity space, um, because I think that's the more intuitive economic space to look at. On the x-axis, I have the expected quantity of clicks the bidder would get. And so here I can show you this blue line 
is how the average cost or the, the price per click would change as you increase the clicks. I've expressed the clicks as a fraction of what you get if you're in the very top position. So this particular bidder is usually around the second position, so they're getting about half the clicks they would get if they were at the top position. Remember I told you position matters. Um, and of course having an estimate of that is an important input to this model as well, of how being in different positions um, change, changes things. So the average cost curve is increasing. If this was the bidder's value, I'm going to show you in a second how I estimated that value, but if this is his value, then, um, then he, doesn't want to, he doesn't want to bid all the way out to where his value equals the cost of clicks because, again, that would give him a, a, a slim profit margin. Okay? Instead, what the bidder wants to do is realize that the more clicks he buys, the higher is the cost of clicks. So here is a marginal cost curve. And so what I've gotten from the, I estimated the average cost and the marginal cost from the data, the marginal cost, again, incorporating exactly how much the cost goes up from buying more clicks. And so my inference is this gold line. I, I estimate the red line. I know in the data how many clicks he was buying, the blue line. So the place where the blue line crosses the red line, magic, bravo, I figured out his value. I know his profits just by finding that intersection. And then I can say, what's his inferred profit? Well, it's the area of this square. The gap between his value and his average cost. This, rec this rectangle here is his profit. Okay. So once the values are known, I can recompute equilibria. And we, we, in the paper, our paper, we also go through computational methods for this. I'll say that one hard aspect, so we can, I can do this really well in small markets, in the real big market, like eBay bids on almost everything, so there's no distinct markets. So all of my tens of millions of bids compete with each other, and that's a very hard fixed point problem to solve. So we've come up with some, some hacks on that, but that's an interesting computational problem for um, you computer science uh, computational folks out there. Um, so let me show you some, two of the counterfactuals, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back and tell you about where we're taking the work. So one of, for the algorithmic game theory folks out there and the economist, you'll, you'll remember, again, we, the Vickery auction is a very central concept. There was a Nobel Prize for Vickery auctions um, a few years back. Um, the Vickery auction is an auction where the bidders pay their expected externality and are supposed to bid truthfully. As a result of bidding truthfully, when you run, and, and the fact that you're going to, um, you're going to the, the Vickery auction, part of its definition is that you're going to allocate efficiently query by query, and because I have true representations of people's values, I'm going to get the right, the most efficient outcome on every single instance of every single query, even in spite of the uncertainty. So the Vickery is going to do very well in this uncertain environment because I don't, the bidder wouldn't want to bid differently in all the different auctions. The fact that they're placing one bid that's going on lots of Vickery auctions, they, if they want, they want to bid truthfully, because if they, they would bid truthfully in every individual auction, so they want to bid truthfully all day long. So they don't, all the stuff we do, all our algorithm changes, they never have to change their bids. So it's very easy for the bidder, and it's also very easy for us. Now, one thing the bidders might not like is they might not like the fact that, they, that, that we think that we know their values, and it might be very tempting for us to do things because we haven't committed. Google certainly has not committed to exactly what they do. So they could say they run a Vickery auction and not run a Vickery auction. They could change their reserve prices, all sorts of other things. So, it's a, so bidders often don't like Vickery auctions. They're easy, but they don't like revealing all that information. That's one reason they were rarely run in procurement auctions and so on. The GSP, on the other hand, is inefficient. It has asymmetric bid shading. So because of this uncertainty and because I showed you about how you don't bid up to your value, but you shade your bid, the different bidders are going to shade, bid less than their value by different amounts. And because they bid, they bid, they shade their bid differently, it's possible that for some score shock realizations, a low value bidder can beat a high value bidder because the high value bidder bid a big gap between his bid and his value and the low value bidder bid close to his value. And so they sometimes reverse. So you get inefficiency. So there's no revenue equivalence. They're not the same auction. It, and so there's, a, there's this long debate about, you know, should we switch? Well, unfortunately, it's hard to switch because the, in the Vickery auction, you bid your value. In the GSP, our estimates are that you should bid about half your value. So it might cost, if, if people left their bids fixed, that they were, they were designed for one mechanism, and you started using them to run a Vickery auction, you might lose about $20, $25 billion. And that's a hard sell to make to your executives, no matter how lovely you think a Vickery auction is. So. Um, it doesn't change. 
um, <laughs> for that and many other reasons. But we can still look theoretically at what the differences would be. And so what we find is that the welfare effects are actually quite small, even though in principle the GSP is inefficient, it's, it's not much less efficient than the Vickrey auction. And then we find that the revenue effects actually are ambiguous theoretically, and we find that they vary across keywords. So we find that for some search phrases, say the Vickery auction raises a bit more revenue. In, um, in other search phrases, it raises a lot less revenue. And so theoretically, it depends on the market structure, and in practice, um, we're generally finding that it, it's bad for revenue, but not by, by a huge amount. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about price discrimination briefly. So, you know, what, if, you're, if you're a machine learning guy out there on the click prediction team, you get very excited if you cl predict clicks more accurately. But then you might get very frustrated if your algorithm doesn't get shipped because it's bad for revenue. So how can this be? If you click, predict clicks more accurately, how could that be bad for revenue? Well, let me just give you an example. Suppose that we have a, what we call a coarse click, click, click predictor. This one doesn't, it can't tell the difference between men and women. So there are men's shoes and women's shoes, but I can't tell when you enter shoes whether you're a man or a woman. So I show you a men's shoe ad and a women's shoe ad. I don't know which one to put first, but I extract all the revenue from them because if they both make about the same amount of profits, I'm going to get a certain amount of revenue from that. On the other hand, if I have a granular click predictor and I can tell the men from the women, when the women comes in, woman comes in, I say the expected revenue bid by the man's shoe ad just falls through the floor because she's not going to click on it. But the amount, the price I'm paying is related to the revenue bid by the guy below. But because I know nobody's going to click on him, he's effectively not there. He's no longer a competitor. So unless you raise your reserve prices or do something else, you can destroy your revenue um, and by, even though you have a more accurate click predictor. Okay? So this, is, this can be a, this is a, presents a trade-off to you between efficiency and revenue. Um, so what we did is we did a counterfactual simulation of a time when, when, when Microsoft introduced a more accurate click predictor, and then we looked at rolling it back to see you know, what would be the, the impact in practice. And so we looked at what happens both when the bids are fixed as well as when the bids adjust to a new equilibrium. Okay? And so what we found is that, of course, the before, and so because we, we, we want to roll back, so coarsening is making it less accurate because that's the way our data is coming. So we're going we're gonna to see that, yes, you get the most welfare when you have the accurate thing before you coarsen. We find that if you introduce coarsening, so you make your click predictor worse, it looks bad in the short run, but actually good in the long run when the bids adjust. Why is that? When you make the, the shoe stores comparable, they realize they're duking it out, and so they bid up to try to compete against each other. When you remove their competition, they realize they can bid down, bid less aggressively, and still get the clicks. So this is a case where understanding the economics of, of accuracy as well as understanding the bidder responses can really change your decisions about what you, what you ship and what you don't. Of course, um, you know, in Microsoft, we're, we're very concerned about the advertiser welfare because you're not providing a lot of clicks, and so you're worried the advertisers are going to move to Google. But in general, if, if you have a lot of monopoly power, you can really exploit this. All right, so let me just quickly wrap up um, talking about what's gone wrong with applying this in practice and why, if I become even more a fan of bringing in new machine learning and Bayesian techniques to make this better. Well, when we actually try to test this, like you can't even actually get that far out of the starting gate because a big fraction of the bidders don't change their bids very often. So if you try to see how are they going to respond, they don't. So no model, rational model, can rationalize that if you can't take into account, first of all, just the, the cost of changing bids and the need for data before you even decide to, um, to invest the time and effort to change a bid. Okay? So you need to model that, and it's huge, that heterogeneity. There's, there's heterogeneity of objectives. There's some advertisers, they use tools, and they can select a, an objective, tell this robot to bid for me to keep me always in the top position. Well, my little model of, of click profit maximizing doesn't ac account for that. But I can have some observables as well as unobservables about that. Uh, there's an observable things that might be correlated with that, but I would also like to infer the unobservable preferences of the bidders. Okay. So what we do now is we're, we're introducing a Bayesian approach to this heterogeneity. We know what the main objective types are that the bidders have. A lot of them have budget constraints. Some of them do position targeting. Some of them track conversions instead of clicks. And of course, some of them optimize at the campaign level and some at the listing level. So all of these things are unobservable. But we can build a Bayesian model 
where by watching the advertisers respond to a series of shocks, and here's the causality, because I, I know the algorithm changed, so I know they got hit with an exogenous shock. So I can see how they respond, and I can form posteriors of which objective. So if, if I raise their price, but they still got up to the top position, they look more like a top position maximizer. But if they act more consistently with the other models, I put more weight, I have more, a higher posterior on that. So I need to model the objective type, the parameters of the objective, as well as their costs of changing bids. Identification, that's the econometrics word for how do I figure out all these parameters. And so we have results about how you do figure them out. And again, the key feature is that the algorithm changes. And in, in, in addition, I've got lots of little experiments because my click prediction algorithm is gonna, get, is gonna increase some people's scores and decrease other people's scores. And for the same advertiser, some of them, some of them, their bids will get a price change and other keywords won't get a price change. So I have lots and lots of heterogeneity and because I'm on the inside, I know exactly where it came from and it didn't come from the advertisers. I can also observe their, um, how often they change their bid to try to get a handle on what their costs are of changing the bid. So I estimate it with Bayesian methods. The output are these posteriors, and then again, I can do counterfactuals. There's a few issues, though. Like, if I don't, if I don't know what their objectives are, then how do I think the bidders think about what the other bidders' objectives are? So you start getting a little tangled up there, but we have some ideas about basically treating the bidders as, as if they know what we know. They're little econometricians. Even though this work is very much in progress, I'll just go, give you a little bit of a teaser about just how important the heterogeneity is. So this is a distribution of baseline um, bid change propensities. This is unweighted, so it's not, rep it's not representative of, of the system as a whole, but it gives you a flavor for the heterogeneity. So we have a bunch of people whose baseline bid change probability is, is, is very low, close to zero. And then we have this, this huge spread of how frequently people change their bid, including guys, in the, and a lot of these are really high value guys, are changing them all the time. And so if, if I don't take account of that heterogeneity, any model of their objectives is going to get totally screwed up because I'm not going to be accounting for the, the frequency with which they optimize. So let me just wrap up. I think the econometric methods have a lot to add to market design and marketplace management for a certain class of problems where understanding a historical stochastic process just doesn't really help you at all. Um, I hope I've convinced you that you know, the experiments and the structural models can work together. We at least have some hope of making progress on, on this seemingly impossible problem. I hope I've convinced the econometricians that the machine learning uh, community actually has some really interesting things to add to us, both in terms of methods as well as some of the, the conventions of always testing your models and having the data tell you how well they perform. Um, and of course, it's not always possible for economists, but in some sense, I think we should be actively seeking out environments like the search environment where I really do see changes in the game at, often enough that I can train and then test um, out of sample. Um, and then finally, you know, again, focusing on model validation rather than just standard errors, which is the obsession of the economists.